So now, as approach the last speaker of this uh, morning session. So Kimberly Muir, uh, I don't know if I pronounced correctly her name. She received a master in art conservation and PhD in art history from Queen's University in Canada. And she is currently associate research conservator at the Art Institute of Chicago. Top. So Still Life is one of a series of works in the so-called linear or late cubist mode in which Picasso worked from late 1921 through late 1922. He produced more than 40 linear cubist paintings during this period, all of which employ flat color fields and lines and grids of various widths. The painting can be seen among other linear cubist works in the background of this photograph taken by Man Ray in 1922 showing Picasso in his studio. Still Life was originally owned by Gertrude Stein, a friend and collector of the artist and an important patron of modern art in Paris in the first decades of the 20th century. The painting uh, remained in the collection of her partner Alice B. Toklas until 1949, entering the Art Institute of Chicago in 1953. Date Dated in the upper left corner, um, February 4th, 1922, the Chicago painting is one of three works, all dated within a two-week period, in which a guitar dominates the center of the work with a wine bottle and a compote at either side. During this period, Picasso was simultaneously working on large neoclassical figurative compositions, including the Art Institute's Mother and Child, which was painted just a few months before Still Life in the summer of 1921. In reference to this period of artistic production, John Richardson noted, so wide is the gulf between the two styles that we are entitled to regard the Picasso of 1920 to 1925 as two separate artists. Picasso used a thin plain weave canvas for um, this still life. Uh, the work has never been lined and retains its original stretcher which bears a brown paper label from the supplier Bourgeois, indicating that it is a number 40 figure standard size stretcher. The canvas appears to have been cut and prepared by the artist. Excess fabric has been pulled around to the back of the stretcher, as seen in the top image. The ground present only on the image plane seems to have been applied after the canvas was stretched. Bare, unprimed canvas is visible around the edges of the composition, as in this detail from the top edge, which also shows where Picasso dated the work. Even more interesting from the reverse of the painting, an entirely different composition, unrelated to the still life on the surface, can be seen. The outlines of a neoclassical still life oriented at 90 degrees to the surface image are clearly visible through the back of the unlined canvas. Infrared and transmitted infrared imaging of the reverse of the canvas helps to clarify details of the composition, which appears to feature a domestic interior still life with a wine pitcher, a mug, a rectangular object thought to be um, perhaps a newspaper. That's this rectangular form here. And uh, another circular form that is mostly obscured by the stretcher crossbar. Uh, ornate curvilinear forms above and below suggest the scene was set up on a tabletop or possibly a flat surface balanced on the seat of a chair. A large rectangular form is placed behind the still life objects propped against the back of the chair. The furniture and objects suggest that the composition was influenced by the interiors of Picasso's home and studio at 23 Rue La Boite. Um, the artist is shown in this residence uh, in a photograph taken by Bressai in 1932. The interiors provided subject matter for several of his compositions, such as the two drawings shown here. And of particular note, the chair depicted in the upper drawing of the dining room and the one that's captured in the photograph appear very similar to the chair in the abandoned painting. A related drawing in the Gothenburg Museum of Art in Sweden shows a similar, though more distilled, uh, version of the composition, and we're grateful to Marilyn McCulley for bringing this drawing to our attention. Here, um, I have flipped the infrared image of the painting horizontally to orient the composition as it would have appeared from the front. And the drawing helps to clarify the rounded form in the painting, which is mostly covered by the stretcher bar, possibly a bread roll or a piece of fruit. 
From the reverse of the canvas, the image uh, appears to be almost a line drawing executed in paint that has soaked or stained through the canvas. Uh, but the transmitted infrared image taken from the front of the painting, which helps to reduce the impact of the stretcher crossbars to some extent, uh, shows that some modeling of the forms was carried out, at least uh, in the wine picture. And, uh, and then also uh, some of the brushwork related to that possible newspaper starts to uh, come to light as well. In the x-ray, the density of some of the forms, particularly the three smaller objects on the tabletop surface, indicates that the first composition was painted in and built up to some degree. The brushwork observed in the x-ray, however, relates mainly to the 1922 still life painting. Only the dense white square from underneath the guitar seems to correspond somewhat to an earlier um, form, the rectangular backdrop that's leaning against the back of the chair. But the edges and overall shape uh, have been slightly adjusted. From the surface of the painting, there is really no evidence of this earlier composition. Um, a cross section taken from the upper right corner in the yellow area indicates that the artist applied a lead white based ground layer over the first painting uh, before starting the second composition. And this appears as the uh, white layer in the reflected light image on the top and as the lightest layer towards the bottom of the back scattered electron image. A thin uh, translucent layer was observed at the bottom of the sample. And this is the darker gray bottom layer in the back scattered electron image. The material was identified as calcium carbonate. Uh, since this is the only sample in which the preparation layers were uh, captured, we're cautious about extrapolating the result, but it does suggest that the calcium carbonate layer may correspond to a priming that was applied to the canvas prior to the first painting. And the presence of a very thin absorbent layer could account for the staining or bleed through uh, of the paint layer, which makes the first composition so visible from the back. If Picasso did block out the first painting, uh, as we suspect he did with this lead white layer, uh, this seems somewhat unusual, as we've heard in, in some of the talks earlier today. Um, and there are several examples in the Art Institute's collection where he painted directly over earlier compositions, often allowing the underlying forms to show through and, and even influence the final composition. The complex layered surface of still life, uh, along with localized areas of wrinkling and lifting paint, and the presence of disfiguring surface coatings prompted a closer evaluation of the artist's manipulation of his painting materials and how the painting had changed over time. The work is composed of distinctly textured areas of paint. Crisp brush marks define the broad areas of color around the perimeter of the composition. The white expanse in the middle was applied with a palette knife. The uh, buttery white paint spread and smeared across the surface. Color changes observed al along the edges of some of the forms and through more thinly painted passages indicate that Picasso reworked some of the broad color fields. Bru blue, gray, and tan tones lie under areas that are now yellow, as can be seen, for example, in this upper left corner image, where a blue underlayer shows through and imparts a dark tonality in places. Dark gray is apparent under areas that are now blue, visible along the edge of this blue form near the left edge of the painting. And dark red and brown tones are visible under the gray and green forms left of center. And uh, as well, some areas seem to have been adjusted in the final stages of painting. For example, in this area, slightly more intense yellow brush strokes were applied in between the black lines on top of a paler yellow hue. The color changes observed throughout the work do not seem to correspond to actual compositional changes, but more tonal changes as the artist sought to rebalance the overall palette of the work. And they hint at a fairly complex process of arriving at the final composition. The red, green, and black lines creating the stripes and grids were applied with narrow flat brushes and their surfaces are often smoother and glossier than the broadly applied fields of color with a more fluid leveled appearance that conforms to the topography of the underlying paint. Where brush strokes are discernible, they have settled somewhat while drying resulting in relatively clean smooth edges. Some of the stripes exhibit uh, areas of micro wrinkling, such as seen here in the upper layers of the black grid. 
The wrinkling has occurred in some areas, but not in others, and seems to be related to localized differences in the buildup of the paint layers and their respective um, drying rates. In this detail of the red stripes, for example, it's interesting to note that the wrinkling occurs differentially along the length of individual strokes. So wrinkling is visible on the left side where the red paint was applied over the gray and black layers, but on the right side where the red stripes span the yellow field and, and the black grid, the red paint retains a relatively smooth, unwrinkled surface. The green stripes left of center exhibit some of the most intense wrinkling um, and had resulted in tenting and flaking paint along several of the tiny ridges seen here um, requiring localized consolidation. The appearance of the red, green, and black lines along with the distinctive wrinkling phenomenon are qualities that are typically associated with the use of house paint such as Ripollin, which Picasso is known to have used in his work from as early as 1912. The visual and drying effects observed in areas of still life can occur with relatively thick applications of quick drying house paint. So the Art Institute has an extensive collection of early 20th century Ripollin paint samples. Um, here I'm showing a paint out of a sample of Ripollin Rouge de Chine from uh, the can pictured. The paint was applied in a fairly thick layer on a glass microscope slide and has developed an intricate wrinkling pattern, uh, one which is frequently encountered in areas of Picasso's paintings thought to contain Ripollin. Receipts in the Picasso archive in Paris document that Picasso did make purchases of Ripollin uh, in this 1921-22 period, but he also bought um, Sicative de Harlem. And again, we are grateful to Marilyn McCulley for sharing this research with us. Although it's difficult to know uh, precisely what the composition of the Sicative de Harlem that, uh, purchased by Picasso actually was at this time, uh, and there certainly would have been variations in formulations among different producers, the literature indicates that traditionally it was a painting medium based on a mixture of copal resin and drying oil that could in part increase body and gloss to tube paints. Experiments adding increasing amounts of modern oil copal uh, painting mediums to a modern artist's tube paint have demonstrated that one can effectively achieve a visual aspect very close to ripple in house paints, including a smooth glossy surface and characteristic superficial wrinkling. The paint uh, straight from the tube is shown at the top and with increasing additions of medium is shown below um, after the paint was applied to the canvas board and in the bottom row after two months of drying. Uh, details of these experiments can be found in the citation listed here. And while by no means considered as historical reconstructions, um, it was a very useful exercise for understanding um, empirically how the handling and texture of the paint could be manipulated and how the surface effects of the dried film could be affected. Of particular note, um, air was often incorporated into the paint during mixing, which sometimes resulted in bubble holes, as you can see in the dried film at uh, 26%. And the development of wrinkling seems to have been impacted not only by the amount of medium added, but also by the thickness of the paint application. So at 73% added medium, the daub of paint was applied in a significantly thinner layer than in the other samples shown here, and dried without much change in the surface appearance. Analysis carried out on samples from the red, green, and black paint indicates that Picasso did not use Ripollin for these areas. Extensive investigations of Ripollin paint formulations have been carried out at the Art Institute over the past decade, and detailed discussion of those findings can be found uh, in these uh, references. In our earlier research, a sample of the green paint was analyzed with SEM, EDS, and Raman spectroscopy and found to consist primarily of viridian and lead white. And these are pigments that, with only a few notable exceptions, have not been found in Ripple and paint samples <clears throat> that have been analyzed, um, where the greens were consistently found to be composed of mixtures of Prussian blue and yellow chromate pigments, with the addition of zinc white for the lighter hues. Furthermore, the large heterogeneous particles of viridian seen in the sample from still life are inconsistent with ripple in paints, which have been found to exhibit finer, more homogeneous particles. The paint from the red stripe included significant amounts of barium sulfate and was pigmented with vermilion. Um, vermilion has not been detected in ripple in paints for indoor or exterior use in samples from between 1897 and 1950. 
Um, it's been identified in some swatches of Ripplin enamel paint for cars, but those samples don't contain uh, similar high levels of barium sulfate as those detected in the samples from still life. Uh, more recently, we have had the opportunity to re revisit some of the samples and carry out complementary organic medium analysis using pyrolysis um, GCMS. Samples of black paint had been taken from a more black area, that's sample 10, uh, and from an adjacent black brush stroke with a slightly glossier surface, sample 9. The black is assumed to be a carbon-based black due to the absence of chemical or elemental uh, markers for other black pigments, such as bone black, in the FTIR or EDS analysis. GCMS analysis uh, confirmed the presence of drying oil in both samples. Uh, in addition, copal was uh, detected in the sample of the glossy black paint, but not in the matte black. Uh, we did not have remaining sample of the green paint, but the copal marker was also detected in the sample from the red stripe discussed in the previous slide. These findings indicate that the smooth, glossy look of the stripes and grids um, were likely achieved through Picasso's manipulation of artist's tube paint using a copal-containing medium, possibly something like the Sicative de Harlem mentioned in his purchase receipts. Before the conservation treatment, the painting had a thick layer of surface grime and a darkened gray acrylic resin varnish. As illustrated uh, in these details taken during cleaning, as the dirt and varnish layers were removed, the surface appearance transformed. The original brighter colors were exposed and the nuances of very, uh, varied paint texture and contrast of matte and glossy surfaces were brought to light. After the varnish and grime removal, however, an intractable uh, yellowed overpaint applied locally to areas of the white form in the center of the composition became distractingly apparent. Um, it was painted on top of undamaged original paint, covering cracks and surface irregularities. Uh, analysis of scrapings of the uh, overpaint indicated that it's a translucent white paint containing um, high amounts of barium sulfate and the GCMS analysis detected drying oil, possibly from the underlying uh, white paint layer, although its presence in the overpaint cannot be ruled out, um, as well as shellac, which could account for the in insolubility of the overpaint during the varnish removal. And the methacrylate can be attributed to the synthetic, var uh, synthetic varnish. As the overpaint was removed using a combination of solvent and mechanical action, the underlying uh, white paint emerged in good condition with Picasso's original surface textures intact. The treatment of still life revealed variations in surface sheen and paint application previously obscured by layers of grime, varnish, and discolored retouching. It also brought attention to some unusual surface phenomena related to interlayer drying and adhesion issues, specifically the flaking, tenting, and wrinkling of the paint that Picasso modified to achieve a range of visual effects for the grid lines. The research and treatment of the painting had been, has been an opportunity to study the distinct compositions superimposed on the canvas, to learn more about Picasso's painting materials, and to think about how his painting had altered in both intended and unintended ways over time, considerations so crucial to understanding and preserving Picasso's works. And we'd like to thank uh, the individuals that have uh, helped with this research. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly, for being in time. And any questions from? Okay, one. Great talk, Kim. Love the images. Um, it helps, doesn't it? <laughs> it does. Uh, when did the painting come into the collection? Uh, Fifty-three. Uh, do you have any uh, treatment records um, from? It was varnished, but you didn't varnish it afterwards, right? Exactly. Yeah, it, the the surface was left unvarnished. Yeah. So the previous treatment, you don't have any records of that. I believe not. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that would have been back in the, the early days. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any extra questions? Do you have Do you have translation? I, I have. Uh, my question is: uh, Do you have uh, found some exudation? from copal resin? On the painting? On the painting? No, no, no. The surface is actually... It's in good state? In, yeah, good in condition. good condition, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Because in the Menina series, uh, we found in several paintings some exudation of resin. Hmm. I don't know if it's a copal or which kind of resin yeah. it is. Yeah, no. Thank you. Yeah, not on still life. Okay, thank you so much, Kimberly. and.